My beloved brothers and sisters, I will not prolong the time. I will uh, bring before you now one of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's hard-working ministers. And all of you are familiar with him. He is the minister of Muhammad's Temple Number no. 7, New York City. And he is also the national representative of our divine leader and teacher, Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the world. We thank Almighty God Allah for blessing us, the black man and the black woman of America, with a divine leader a divine teacher and a divine guide in the personage of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. To our beloved Brother Minister Yusuf Shah, members of the official staff of Muhammad's Temple Number no. 2, and my beloved brothers and sisters, I count it a great honor and a great privilege to have this opportunity to say a few words to you on behalf of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, a man whom we are about to see and experience. You know, to see does not just mean to look at, but to see means to perceive what you are looking at. To see means to realize what we are looking at. To see means to comprehend, to understand what we are looking at. In a few moments, we are going to see with the physical eye a man. In my mind, he's the most beautiful man who ever lived. You may ask, why would you say that a man that we are about to see is the most beautiful man that has ever lived? We are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that Almighty God Allah is the creator of beauty. Since Allah is the creator of beauty and is a lover of beauty, God must be beautiful. If God raises up a man as a messenger for you and me, not a man like the other apostles and prophets of God, for those men saw God in a dream or a vision or heard his voice in their ears. But this man is the one of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face. A man prepared by God and sent by God from the face of God. Not a man like men in the past, but a unique man. An incomparable man. A man that there is no thing in the heavens of the earth that you can compare this man with or to or this man. All praise to you, Allah. man is 
is created for the glory of God. And upon him has the glory of God risen, according to Scripture. So since he's from God, a messenger of God, styled in Scripture as the Son of God. Now you must remember that the Son is not the image, for an image is not made of the same essence of that which it is the image of. Oh, praise the future, Allah. But this messenger of God, styled as the Son of God, is of the same essence of his Father. Meaning that in him is the God, he, God is indwelling within the Son. And all that is necessary is for the Son to develop, for the Son to grow up, for the Son to mature in the wisdom of his Father. And when you see the Son, you will see the Father. All praise is due to our life. Allah is beautiful? How could a son of God be other than beautiful? A son of God reflects God. A son of God is a manifestation of the Father in the midst of us. Now, he will be here shortly. If you don't mind, you know, we like to shine light on the man himself so that you will not see him with a physical eye alone, but you will realize who it is you're looking at. You're looking at a man that the scriptures refer to as the Lamb of God. A Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. That's a mistake. The Lamb is not here to take away the sins of the world, but the Lamb of God is here to take away the sins of the black man who have been destroyed by the world. And we saw their garments, their garments were washed white in the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb, as Messenger Elijah Muhammad explained so beautifully last week, is a young member of the sheep family. He styled as the first begotten of the dead or the first born of God. Messenger Muhammad says that the black man of America is dead. And none of us can deny that fact that the black man is as a dead man. He has eyes, but he cannot see. He has ears, but he cannot hear. He has a tongue, but he cannot speak. He has legs, but they don't walk in the direction of self. Therefore, he is as a dead man. But the first born of the dead is the first man who recognized God who would visit among the dead and raise one up from the dead. Yes, many saw Master Farad Muhammad, but they didn't recognize what they were looking at. So then did they see him? No, we declare to you this afternoon that no man saw God but he who recognized him and that one you are about to see in a few minutes. And that is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Their garments were washed white in the blood of a lamb. The messenger of our lives like a lamb. He's meek and humble. But he's also styled as a lion too. So we cannot mistake him as a lamb 
and make a mistake in dealing with him lest we get caught up by the paw of a lion. But the book says their garments were washed white in the blood of a lamb. How can you wash a garment white in red blood? But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a man whom God has raised up to interpret for us the wisdom of the Bible and Holy Quran, has made it clear sunshine for us. As blood is the life fluid of any living creature, the blood of the Lamb is the life of the messenger lives according to the spirit and will and revelation of God to him. He is a people dirty by the world. You can't deny the fact that we have been made dirty and filthy by the white man's world. You and I have been dipped in the mud of the white man's civilization. A people who are righteous by nature but wrong by circumstance. Huh? Hey, people who are lovers of filth. We got to agree on truth. Is it not true that the black man today has been made a filthy man? Is it not true that we have been made liars and thieves and cutthroats? Yes, it's true. Well, who is going to clean us up from this? The man that is about to come into this great and holy temple is the man who has washed our garments white in the life that he taught us how to live. You can't deny that a Muslim is trying to live a clean life. Some of us may be your sons or your daughters or your friends and you knew us when we were worshippers of a blue-eyed enemy devil and you see us now that we've come to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And you have to bear witness that Elijah Muhammad's life and the spirit in him is what has caused us to clean ourselves up. He's a mighty man. A lamb. But out of his mouth, the book says, when a two-edged sword. That's something to think about. This last messenger would not Rely on the carnal weapons of the enemy. You may run out and say, pick up a gun. You may run out and say, pick up a knife. But Elijah Muhammad has been given a sword in his mouth. A two-edged sword. A sword of justice that cuts both nations black and white. A sword of truth that is so powerful. The book says it separates the spirit from the flesh and even the marrow from the bone. Oh, that's a powerful truth. A truth so powerful that the book says it would root out kingdoms, tear down nations, and build up. Here's a truth now that's going to root out, tear down, and build up. Now, that's a powerful truth. What kind of man would it have to be to speak that kind of truth? Every man can't speak truth. It takes a certain kind of man to speak that kind of truth. You all all right? All right. A lot of men know truth, but fear chokes them up. And they won't speak what they know. Why won't you speak the truth? You're afraid. I'm afraid I may get punished. I'm afraid that this may happen to me. Well, you're not worthy of the truth. In fact, you're not worthy of life. If the truth is that upon which the heavens and the earth is created and established and maintained, what kind of man is it who is afraid to speak the truth? Some of you are not even afraid to speak it. You're afraid to hear it. Oh, that's terrible. But look at this man, Elijah Muhammad. I boast in that man. I boast in the messenger of God. 
He's a magnificent man. This man, Elijah Muhammad, was fashioned for the truth, and the truth was fashioned for him. It's a wedding that has taken place, therefore he's referred to in Scripture as the Spirit of Truth. Jesus prophesied of him in these words. There are many things that I could tell you now, but you can't bear it. How be it when he is come? He who? That man that we're about to look at in a few minutes, when he is come, the spirit of truth. He's not just truth, but in him is the very spirit of the truth. That's a powerful man. Because truth carries its own spirit. But you've got to believe in the truth to unlock the truth and get out of the truth the power that's in the truth. He is a man made for the truth. And a man that the truth was created to come through. Oh, brother. What a man, Elijah Muhammad. What kind of man is he, huh? Oh, praise the people of Allah. going to come out of this man's mouth. A word that will tear down nations. If his word is going to tear down nations and his word is truth, what were the nations built upon? The nations had to be established under falsehood in order for truth to tear down a nation. If, if truth is going to tear down nations, then there are going to be a lot of people angry at this man when he opens up his mouth to speak. But if that man is a man of God, he doesn't care who gets angry with him. Oh, praise the people of He's 
a courageous man. He's a fearless man. He's a brave man. He's a wise man. He's a humble man. He's the messenger of God. He's tearing up the kingdoms of the world. The white man's government is confused. England is confused. France is confused. The Buddhist countries are confused. The Islamic governments are confused. And literally like it. That man that the book calls the spirit of truth. He stands alone. Alone. Him and his God. He said that Allah, whom the whole Muslim world of near 600 million worshipped as a spook, he said, you got it wrong. Allah is a man. And he stood back. And he wants you who believe in a father, a son, and a holy ghost, he condemns your trinity of God. And he takes on the whole Christian world and he stands back. You who believe in Buddhist or Hindu, he condemns your gods and your religion. You who think you are wise, he condemns your wisdom as though it is nothing and he alone stands. With a God backing him up. And he's a winner. He's a winner. This is the kind of man we're about to see. A messenger of God. You know, he's a dangerous man. I love to tell you this. Because he's in your midst. And sometimes, when a man is in your midst all the time, you may take him for common. You may think he's a man that you can play with. You may not watch yourself around him. You may say, well, I know him, but you don't know him. You know a form, but you don't know the spirit. And if you don't know the spirit of that man, you don't know Elijah. That man is a stranger to you. But you better get wise to who he is. Because if you make a mistake in dealing with that man, God will get after you. In fact, he's after you now. God is not common. Therefore, his messenger is not common. <laughs> oh, no, brother. In the book of Isaiah, the eighth chapter talks about it. It speaks of the messenger saying, he is a sanctuary, but for some, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for both the houses of Israel and a gin and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's you. That's you. I don't, I tell you, when I have to tell the truth, because I'm his follower. And if I'm going to follow him, I don't care nothing about what you like or what you dislike. No. Don't tell me I'm a visitor. I'm not a visitor. I belong to Muhammad. to see every one of you who have experienced Elijah Muhammad, who have sat down with him, who have been close to him, you're going to be called to account for how you have done by this man. Sometimes I feel sorry for you. Because the chastisement of Allah upon a people who receive a messenger and then treat the messenger disrespectfully yes, is severe. That's right. Hmm. That's right. He's not a man that you could take lightly. Though he's meek and he's humble. Hmm? 
He's the most humble of men in public. He's a modest man. But he knows his weight. He weighs with the weight of God. Therefore, the book says, if he fall on you, you'll be ground to powder. And since he knows his weight, he tries to warn you as you get close. Don't stumble over me and don't make me angry enough to fall on you. Yes, he's a sanctuary. I watch how people go to church and when they get near the altar, the holiest of holy places, they tighten up. They get themselves together because this is the sanctuary. They're careful about how they speak because this is the sanctuary. They're careful about how they talk and about how they walk because this is the sanctuary. But the book is not talking about a sanctuary of stone and marble. The book is talking about a sanctuary, a man in whom God lives. You should be. You shouldn't act as the foolish. They don't know. Therefore, God may forgive them because they're ignorant. But what about you who say you know? What about you who say you see? What about you who say you understand? How are you walking around that sanctuary? The book says, for some, he's a sanctuary. We take him as a sanctuary because we believe in him. I believe he's the messenger of God. In fact, I know he's the messenger of God. That's right. I couldn't help but know it. That's right. Here's a man that took me from nothing. Yes, sir. Here's a man that took me out of the alley. Right. Here's a man that took me a bum. Right. A no good man. Right. And that man breathed into me of the inspiration of the God that raised him up. Right. He put wisdom in my head and love in my heart for Allah, for him and for you. I know he's a God-raised man because Muhammad couldn't do what he has done if God were not at his back. But if God is with Muhammad, what do you look like staying away from him? If God has raised him up, what do you look like not reasoning with this man? He's in your city, Chicago. The book speaks evilly of you. It says, oh, Jerusalem, thou that stonest and killest the prophets of God. That's heavy. It said the work that were done in you had they been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom would have repented, come out in ashes and sackcloth. That's right. Muhammad has done more in the city of Chicago for you than any leader of black people has done in any city anywhere in America. But for those of you who disbelieve in him, and those of you who mistreat him, he's a stone of stumbling. And he's a rock of offense. Right. You become offended by his teaching. Right. What are you offended by? If he tells you that the white man is a devil, can you prove that the white man is a saint? You say, I know some good ones. How do you know a good one when you're not good yourself? Somebody got to come and make you good. Because God has never had a man that he gave the job to that 
this man was given by Allah. And it's a shame that with a city full of people and a country full of people that we won't rise up and help this messenger of God. But we sit around and wait for him to work and we eat off of what he works. Instead of laboring with him and for him for the resurrection of the dead. Yes, you may be angry, but I'm happy to tell you the truth. Whether you like that truth or not, this is God's messenger. And I warn you that every one of us will pay and pay a dear price. My brothers and sisters, the book said he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of of offense for both houses of Israel. Muhammad teaches us that Israel represents the white race. This man, Elijah Muhammad, is a stumbling stone for white folks. America is stumbling over little Elijah. As Pharaoh stumbled over Moses. Pharaoh lost his government because he didn't see his way to heed the warning in the mouth of an ex-slave. Some of you are just like your white masters. So proud over your ignorance. So lofty in your foolishness. You have your degrees, but a fool on top of it. And a fool is as a fool does. If you have a degree and have done nothing with it, if you have a degree and your people are hungry, naked, and out of doors, and your degree has not qualified you to help the black man to help himself, then your degree is a yoke around your neck that is dragging you down into the pit of hell. Black man... Elijah Muhammad. Why do you stumble over him? Because he didn't have a degree from Harvard? A degree from Yale or Radcliffe? Because he doesn't speak the language as you think he should speak it? I want to tell you that Elijah Muhammad is a master of the English language. I want to tell you... is the most eloquent speaker ever to live. What do you mean? He's eloquent because his speech is effective. You can use big words, doctor, lawyer, counselor. You can talk loud but say nothing. Elijah Muhammad. Oh, but he's a, he's a stone of stumbling for both houses. White Israel and the children of Israel who love the white man and hate their black self. But the books say he's a gin and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You know, when God wants to punish you, He put something of value around you that he values, and he watches how you treat it. You know, that's terrible. Some people say, I'm so honored. I'm close to the messenger. I don't know about that. Uh That's not such a good position to be in. Unless you recognize who it is that you're close to. See, that's a dangerous position for a blind person to be in. That's a dangerous position for a fool to be in. You don't want to get too close. Hmm. Unless you make a mistake. My dear brothers and sisters, you know when they say he's a djinn and a snare, 
I looked up the word gin. It means a trap set for game. Right. Mm-hmm. The little messenger of God has been set in your midst. And I'll tell you how you think about him traps you. Yeah. If you've got an evil thought in your head about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, your thought sets a trap for you. Yeah. And he who set him here will absolutely be the one to have to take you out of the trap. But he won't take you out until he punishes you. And even thought against the messenger will get you hell. Now what do you think about those who try to fight him and oppose him? Nobody who opposes the Honorable Elijah Muhammad will be successful. He's in your city. I say to you, carry him on your shoulder. Hold Muhammad up high. Make the world to respect this vessel of God. If you don't, Allah will. I am thankful to Almighty God, Allah, that he blessed me to meet with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I've been looking for this man all the days of my life that I can remember myself. I was always looking for some man who would help the black man. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know who he was. I knew that if God were just and he sent Moses to deliver Israel and Daniel to deliver the Hebrews in Babylon and Jesus after the Jews, surely if God is just, he would send somebody after us. I set my heart to search for this man. I didn't know that I would find him one day, but I was looking for him. I love black people and I hated to see black people suffering under this enemy devil. Before I knew Islam, I prayed for God to destroy America. I hated America for what America had done to black people. And when I found this man, Elijah Muhammad, and heard the words out of his mouth, I knew that this was the man I'd been looking for all my life. So, I decided to give my life to him. All that I have belonged to Elijah Muhammad. Everything I know he taught me, therefore my life is for him. What about yours? You talk too soft. I ask you a question. I said my life is for Elijah Muhammad. What about yours? Assalamu alaikum. You may be seated. Again, I say, I salam alaikum. Brothers and sisters, I'm very happy to see you smiling face. <laughs> that uh, makes me feel good to see no vacancy, but a little. And I think before we are finished, it will be filled. <clears throat> we continue our subject, the theology of time. As this is the thing that you should know. 
what has been hidden from you and what is being kept hidden from you. I'm the fellow that is raised up here to open my mouth and tell you what Allah has revealed to me that was hidden and that the prayer of the Prophet Abraham and others uh, should be fulfilled. That is, that God will raise up a teacher from among ourselves and teach us the truth of this world and the truth of ourselves which this world have deprived us of. And so, this is the little boy that you read of there in the Bible. <laughs> if you take note of the name Elijah in the Bible, it comes in the Old Testament and leaves out in the New Testament. He is followed by many uh, witnesses of the prophets and the local prophets. Yes, Some of the local prophets don't have too much to say, but he goes directly at the point. We call them minor prophets. Yes, he don't miss nothing of what has been revealed to him. He tells it right out. I hope you are hearing me. Uh, the mic up here, you will have to tell me yourself whether you are hearing well. Mm -hmm. Because you are listening and I am speaking. And you can tell me whether my speaking is getting over to you clear enough for you to understand. We don't want you coming up telling Allah, I didn't understand him. I didn't hear him so well. Something was wrong with that mic and they should have fixed it. So I should have heard it. <laughs> and I would not have been out here with the disbelievers. So we don't want you to have no excuse. In the past we find where the messengers of God uh, had people claiming an excuse. But this messenger is to make it so plain that you can't claim it an excuse. And I watch you to see if you uh, misunderstand me. And you're welcome after I'm uh, said about all I intend to say this afternoon to ask me questions if you didn't understand. But I don't invite you to ask me something just to uh, be talking. Yes, I will try and keep you from that in what I say. But if you think that you have found something that I failed to say in what I say, I won't say in all because you won't have time to stay here to hear all that I have to say. And I won't have time to stay here and tell you. <laughs> A lot of us takes it for granted that the Holy Quran is something inferior to the Bible. The only inferior part it is that it came after the Bible. 
and the uh, Bible went before the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is not only the Bible, but it verifies what is written in the Bible. And the Bible verifies what is written in the Quran. They are not two enemy books. They are two books which verify each other. In the Bible, uh, it reads there, when you open it, the first page of the chapter 1 in the Bible of Genesis. It says there that in the beginning, in the beginning, right? In the beginning of what? See? We must get these hidden truth understandable. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, when was that? See, that's all you have there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What beginning? You see, you should set a time there uh, so that we will know when the beginning was. See, you leave us to argue with you there. But if you would say it like this, God created the heavens and the earth. And don't say in the beginning, because you didn't finish that up. But if you... T- But if you had said, in the beginning, which was about so long and so long, or it was so long and so long, don't say about, because it had a beginning, there's nothing before us nor behind us what didn't have a beginning. We used to say, Nobody knows. That was right. But there was a beginning. You see. If God was not before the beginning, uh, what counts you have? Then who was it before him? Because he was the beginning himself. Listen at it good. The beginning of time was made by the beginning of God. We had no beginning before he made himself. We could not calculate on time because there was no motion making time. But after he made himself, he made a motion. Then we've been reading time ever since. Understand me good. Let me go back over. In the beginning, that was when God was making himself from an atom of life. And the motion of the atom was counting time, but we didn't know how to count it. And he didn't who was being made. So we had to wait until his complete mate and set up a time clock for us. His motion in coming out of the atom was making time, but there was no one to calculate it. He couldn't calculate it himself because he had not yet been matured enough in his brains to calculate his own movements. So, we have here today, sitting in the arena of time, me and myself, God has taught me in the person of Master Farad, 
Muhammad, how these things begin working. And I am teaching you so that no man can deceive you, as the Bible says. And that no man can argue with you and win his side of the argument unless he's on your side. We are very happy that the coming of God, whom the Christian call, which is one of his attributes, to be living in such glorious times. It's a glorious time because you are being accepted for something that you thought you were not. as a righteous person and not as a wicked person. Think of all the sin that Satan caused us to commit. We are not guilty of it. Allah declares that he will not charge us up with the sin of Satan before he arrives. So some of us have did of quite a bit of sin. And we are certainly happy to know that book won't be shown to us. <laughs> and that uh, the world that the devil has poisoned, I don't mean no spirit now. I mean that blue-eyed Caucasian walking out there where you can see. <laughs> you never will meet anything like shining the devil after you are dead. You won't meet him. No. Because death takes away everything. There is no coming back. I don't know uh, whether you Christian believers is ready to believe it right now or not, but anyway, go home and think it over. <laughs> and you will come back and tell me if there's any coming back. Uh, that Mohammed you told other than the truth. You see, I am here. Then I will say, a great day in the morning. <laughs> There is so many people that don't like to come and listen to Muhammad because he said there is no heaven or hell for us after we die. That when we die, that's the end of us. I said, brother, if there was an end coming back to us, there was another chance. I would be a greater believer in that than you. <laughs> because that would convince me that I am preaching wrong. I will come back. And I would like to have a chance if there is anything like coming back to come back. But if you put the cold, chilly hands of death on me now and then wake me up and warm them up again, I would say that I would not feel like getting up. I would be afraid something else is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, once death put me to sleep, let me remain asleep. That I'm not conscious that I'm asleep. And I don't want to get conscious that I'm asleep if i got to come back again. For that same way, like the Bible teaches you, and there's a lot of Christian ministers take it just for that, that God raised ladders up out of the grave, giving life again. Well, then why did ladders have to die again? Because God is more intelligent than that. 
he would not have raised Lazarus up and then let him die again, the physical death. He would have been mistreating Lazarus. But that's the misunderstanding of the preacher. The death there don't mean a physical death. He declared that himself when he told to come to the grave. And that Lazarus was dead, he said, he's not dead. He's just asleep. Meaning that he's not physically dead. Show me where you have lain. And he went and looked at Lazarus still declaring he's not dead. And then he called on his Lord not to try to try to God. He was well aware that God knew what he was wanting. He said, in words, I'm not trying to tempt you, but for the sake of these that stand by, the disbelievers, that you answer my prayer for what I'm asking for because I'm not trying. I know you can raise it. But for the sake of these disbelievers, you, I say, I could change that today. For the sake of this believing black people, <laughs> let him rise. The white people, the devil, have so thoroughly killed us of the knowledge of self that they don't think that no man could take you out of what he has put us in. The FBI told me, an agent, one day, uh, he was asking me about some of my followers. He said, Elijah, you have a hard job. I say, you made it hard. <laughs> he looked at me and smiled. He said, oh, Elijah, I was not here three or four hundred years ago. I said, but you are from those that were here three or four hundred years ago with the same mind. He laughed again. He said, you want to just accuse us anyway, like?" And we wasn't here. That was our father. I said, show me whether that you have changed your father's teachings to our people are not only in a more, a higher way of putting a man physically, or pardon me, mentally dead. I said, you know more how now to put your father work to a such high degree that the man don't know he's dead. So my beloved listeners, we are here with the truth. Whether you believe it or not, you are here. So here it is, but leave it a little long. I'm not here to force you to believe. But I am here to condemn that which you believe in. That uh, you won't be able to condemn me in what I believe. Because we make it so plain. Even in the book that we read, Bible and Holy Quran, you want to make the Holy Quran something that is not worthy to be respected as the Bible. We make the Holy Quran more res uh, respected because that the people that translated the Holy Quran was not liars. But the people who translated the Bible, they added in to the truth. Not that the Bible don't contain truth, plenty of it if you understand. But they made it hard for you to understand by making the truth in symbolic language and you cannot understand that which they have made symbolic. So Allah has risen up to you an interpreter of the Bible and the interpreter of the Quran. 
which he has given to me to rely on to teach you the truth of Islam. <clears throat> the religion of Christianity does not make it clear enough for you to know the truth. You as a man going. Yeah, I'm going on, but I'm going on with the truth to you. <laughs> In the Bible, as I said, the truth is covered up by symbolism. And you don't know what the symbolism is. Look at those horses in the Bible that he tells you they are speaking. The Holy Quran does not use no such fancy. But the Bible uses all of this to blind you to the knowledge of truth. And I saw another horse come out. And on him was such and such type of writer. These are governments that he's referring to of his own civilization. But he don't want you to know the truth that it's referring to him because the picture of it looks ugly. Then I saw another horse, a black horse, and his rider had a pair of balances in his hand. This is you and me in our time of the control of the world. That we have been robbed of the truth by them. And that uh, this writer is your people on that black horse. This is one thing that they don't deny that the black man will be last. Even in this symbolism of teaching, he still is declaring that the black man will be the last. My friends, to get born and nourished into the knowledge not the knowledge, into the civilization of the devil, the white race. You cannot realize it until you have been made right in the understanding of the truth. Then you understand then that you will suspect to the knowledge of it. Well, let us move along. I'm not going to run. Hurry, you didn't run to get here when I called you 40 years ago. <laughs> so this time, I'm going to take my time <laughs> because I know what is going to take place. Allah has taught me what's going to take place in this time. Some of it I don't like to tell you. Not <clears throat> it won't make you feel so good. And so I want you to feel good while I'm teaching you. Let us get back again at the time. If the Bible teaches you that the devil will have the power of the people to rule them until God come and destroy him. This is true. And that God prepared hell for him in the day that he was made. Think over that. Before ever the man was made, hell was prepared for him. Now, if the Bible teaches you that, Christian believers, why do you want to go along with it? Since his designation is hell. 
But you say, I don't know when that will be. Neither do you. No one is given that hour but God himself. And then he passes it over to that angel that you read of in the Revelation that places one foot on water and one on land. The preachers used to fancy in that. Of course, they didn't get too far from the truth. They used to say that they, he, the angel would ask God, how loud must I sound? He'd make it a little fancy there. I used to hear my father preach it. And he'd put fancy to it because he didn't know. But to do our own fancy, our fancy is removed. And the light of the truth must shine so clear that you cannot claim there was a cloud between you and it. This is the little boy that is talking to you now. There is nobody coming behind me but God. I better tell you that. I'm like it's written there where it says in the Bible that the for that great and dreadful day, I will send you Elijah. And he shall prepare the way. He must have enough convert to lay claim to the devil's world that God has some people in it. And we can't execute judgment on the enemy until we separate them. Separate the enemy from the righteous. So the first thing he did, he declared all of us righteous. How did he do that? Because you follow Satan and all that you do of evil, you've gotten it from Satan. So now, Satan is to be destroyed and God has come to take that which is not here and give him his own. Now, how are we going to escape? It's plain. What you were doing, you were falling after him, the devil. Now God comes and declares you to be not one of the devils, that you are one of the righteous. You say, I haven't been right. No, you haven't. That which you were unrighteous in was not yours. That was the devil. His work. And you had no teacher to other with the devil that his work that he has caused us to do was not our work by nature. Because we are not a devil by nature. So being deceived by the devil, and we didn't know who he was, we didn't have no teacher of our own to tell us to come back. Don't follow that man. He kept them away from us. When they come in the country, he kept them among himself. And we never knew he, any of them was here because we didn't know ourselves. We used to wonder why these black Africans come in here and he show more respect to them than he do us. We all look alike. He was trying to keep your black brother from Africa from mixing with you to teach you some truth of that which he had lied on. That you are learning today, because as it is written, in the vision of the dream of Jacob, that uh, he saw a, a ladder reaching from heaven to the earth, and angels sending and descending. 
Well, you didn't never understood what it was because he had put your mind so far in spooks. Something that is not a person. It's something like a air out there, you know, form is out there, up air, in air. Well, you just didn't never understand. If he saw a ladder reaching from earth to heaven, an angel sending and descending, this was people, and this is the connection link. This is what prophets, teachers of God, is one to be done that the people and the devil's civilization come out, go up to Allah, the ladder of time and teaching. So why Jacob saw this ladder, uh, which means uh, the connecting of you and I with the God righteous people that is called angels. It is true that he was looking at the end of his time, that the people he had deceived would one day be connected with the people of righteous, and that they would be going from heaven and from the earth where they live. Today, you'll find this in the Muhammad Speak newspaper on the front page over the head of it. Black man locking hands with black man. This has that interpretation that we who has been lost from the way to get to God in the heaven that he prepared for us is now coming to pass that you can shake hand with your brother all the way around the earth. He will respect you. Highly expect you if you say that I'm a follower of Elijah or belief. He recognized the fact that this man is the man we've been looking for to join us together again. Their scientist comes to me sometime almost weekly because they recognize what I mean. This is the day of uniting. Africa is uniting with us because as the Holy One teaches, they heard a call calling to the right way. Therefore, they are here among you today, principal, sanctity, walking around with the mouth shut, waiting for a certain time to open it. So the time given to the white man is up and he don't deny. He don't deny his time is not up. He preaches it to himself. As in the Holy Quran, it is said there that where he tries to clear himself of misleading you, he says, I did not uh, call them to go astray. I just called them and they come. He said, I'm not responsible. They are responsible. He goes to try to show some things he has did to try to open your eyes. But he knew you were not going to open up. And uh, he couldn't tell it strong like the God sent messenger because by nature he was made to hide the truth. When you go to the white man to sit down, for him to teach you the truth, he misleads you. Because the truth is against him. 
and the truth is his doom. So never go to him looking for no uh, truth from him. He's not made of the material. When he was made, he was made a liar and made to oppose truth and to oppose you that believe in it. Oh yes, I'm taking my time this afternoon. I was looking at the lift profession, how it is uh, taught in the whole of Quran, but I don't think that you should be worried about that, neither should I. We go a little closer to the teachings of truth and how the enemy, the white man, hates it. The greatness of man is this subject here. In uh, chapter 2 of the Quran, under the name the cow. This is the name of the chapter because it's uh, teaching about the devil's worshiping a cow. So they took cow for their subject. Here we say, we read in chapter 2, 34th and 35th verse, reads like this. And when we said to the angel, be submissive to Adam, they submitted. But Iblis did not. He refused and was proud. This is the devil, white man. And he was one of the disbelievers. Now what is said here, he was one of the disbelievers, it means that there was just a stronger opposition and opposing uh, by us at this time as it was in the days of Adam. And when we said, O oh Adam, dwell thou and thy wife in the garden and eat from it a pinchous food. Now listen to what it says here now. And a put not this tree, this tree is the devil. Let you be of the unjust. We have already experienced this. Now, we have for many years followed the devil and what he said was the truth. And now, for, for taking his advice, we are here now being brought up to the knowledge of the truth of this man. And that uh, <clears throat> next verse says, reads like this, and as to those who disbelieved in the rejection of our messenger, they are the companions of the Father. And it they will abide. What power can they divide in, uh, abide in? You can abide in a literary power, but the fire he is referring to is the punishment of what you will get in this life for not accepting the truth. You will be unsuccessful in carrying out that which you think you have of the truth. If it is not of Allah, and the message that he gives is seven, 
you cannot be successful. And the Holy Quran teaches us, you want to know the successful one? This is the way it teaches. Those that believe in Allah and His Messenger, they are the successful ones. Over here in the fourth, fifth verse, it's really of the same chapter too. It reads like this. <clears throat> Seek assistance through prayer. Think over that. Some of us don't never pray at all. Only when we do get in trouble. Then we are like a man sinking at sea. He never believed that Allah will help him until he's going down in the water of Allah. That water Allah made. And it can sink us as good as it can make us to feel joyful by riding on its back. And seek, seek assistance through patience and prayer. And this is hard except for the, the humble ones. Because they don't pray. And when they need to pray, and their most troublesome time of life disaster, they don't know how to, how to pray. They didn't believe in Allah in the beginning. But he will call on Allah any God that is powerful enough to hold back the power of the water to keep it from drowning. This, the Holy Quran teaches that Pharaoh did not never pray and recognize God that he was the all-wise and the most powerful one until he started sinking in the Red Sea. Lungs getting full of water, he know that was the end of him. So the Holy One teaches, then he said to Allah, recognizing his greatness and power over him, he call on him in Arabic, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So by admitting that Allah was the greatest, after death had taken hold of his body to take him in, Allah at that moment recognizing him to be the greatest, whom he had opposed all his life, that he now given him an over drink of water in which he was supposed to live by. His lungs all filled up now with water. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah heard him. Think over that. He heard him and, and he Taking those two words, think over that, to make them live in order to convince other disbelievers that if you call upon him and recognize him to be the greatest, he will pardon you of your sins. So he pardoned Pharaoh and caused Pharaoh's to be talked about and be honored and those who had or would have the knowledge of truth that this king opposed Adam 
or pardon me, opposed Moses until he had no air in his lungs to continue to oppose. But by recognizing Allah as being the greatest, that was recognizing Allah to be greater than he was. So Allah forgave him, though he was dying. But he made his name to, to be remembered. This time is referring only to the white man and those who willfully, after knowing, will continue to follow. Though they had a chance, God forgive them if they would leave the devil and come to him and go back to the people because they are not guilty of the devil's sin. And he has declared them to be free of the devil's sin. So the angel is a very beautiful uh, sight here. He put one foot on water and one on land, so the book says, the Bible. <coughs> this, this is true universally out of both books. Here is the secret of it. The man was raised <coughs> excuse me off of the food and water out of the the earth and out of the water he ate food to survive. So the angel is cutting them off from both. He puts his foot on land and on water too. Because without either one of these, you can't exist. So his left feet, the book teaches us, and his left hand and his right hand and his right foot, the right hand and the right foot, foot hanging on water and the left foot hanging on both water and land so there must be a, a division made now since you've gotten your life out of both I have to declare that the time that you was to feed from both is up <laughs> time no now will soon know no more the time given to the enemy is up and it won't be known anymore. God is declaring that he won't exist and no point. Nor will his way of teaching the people will exist. So he's got to go he in all his works. The 45th verse says, Seek assistance through patience and prayer. You need to have both. You need to say your prayer. And you need to be patient. So wait on the Lord and don't try to run ahead. Because you can't be the head runner. You are run into something that you cannot put out of your way. Very beautiful. So if you get in a hurry, ask the Lord to assist you to be patient. In the 46th verse of the second surah here, the 
in uh, Arabic, they call it call a chapter, sir, in the Quran. We call them chapter in the English language. He says, who know that they will meet their Lord and that to him they will return. This is the believer, the Muslim. They know that they again will meet with their Lord like the Bible teaches too. Because he, he came to them, they recognized him to be God. And he put the faith into their heart to continue to believe like all is put in a burning vessel to keep light. So therefore you five wise and five foolish have a place here in this. Those who know that the bridegroom was coming, they kept their lamp burning. And those who didn't believe it, they let the all burn out. And that the noise was made, here is the bridegroom, go out to meet him. These were surprised because their belief had gone out. And they had no belief that he was coming back. Just like all went out of a lamp and that they all have no more power to give life. So that's the way it was with half of these who started out. All had all. All had the faith. But it went away from them. As the Holy Quran refers to this kind of time of those who turned hypocrite, time came prolonged and hearts hardened. That show you how the people love this world. They can't have patience to wait too long for an execution of it by divine. So they get uh, unhappy and restless and they say something similar to what we find over here in the Bible. In Paul's epistle, he says, they would say, why have we walked mournfully? And the wicked, meaning those that is not doing this, they are happy. And here we're going around mournful looking. But the Lord heard this thing. And the Bible says, when he write up his people, those that was afraid to turn back into the world, he said, those will be his. These will be mine. When a man is brave uh, to break the law of God, which is good, then he's defying God to bring about his execution to him for breaking the law because he's disregarding it and he don't like it and he goes back to the enemy of God to join up with him again then when he sees the approaching doom he will want to go back in and join up with God but Allah is not cheap he is self-independent. <laughs> he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to save the world. Wrong. God never was so foolish to give the best angel to save the weak. This only begotten son means he is the only one that was raised from the mental death and was prepared by God by teaching him 
how to teach the people to bring them back to a mental life. So, I'm here calling you to return to your own. <laughs> What's wrong with your own that you don't like it when you are the beginning and the end? of this world. You begin this world from making it from you and me. Yaakov, the father of the Caucasian race, he made the Caucasian from out of a weak germ of us. He didn't go out and get something that was not already in existence to make him a man. He come right back to himself and looked into the germ of the black man and found a man. Therefore, it is true that you are the first and will be the last. No man can produce another man equal to the black man without going to the black man. As we go along, you will notice that we're leaving nothing to be explained. No. If you would ask me questions after I'm ready to dismiss myself, remember now that you don't ask the question that I have already answered. I'm not going to leave no question for you. Well, I warns us here in the 44th verse of the second chapter he says do you enjoin men to be good do you enjoin men to do good or in words he said do you teach other men to do good and neglect your own life <laughs> do you enjoin men to be good and neglect your own souls while you read the book. You read the book. It teaches you to be good. Bible and whole one. And then if you don't be good while teaching others to be good, you will be the loser and they will be the winner. Because they did good, they believed in it but you being the preacher of good and then neglect to be good yourself. Did you, I'm saying this, did you think just the name was going to save you? No. You, you have to be saved by works. Your work will save you. But not telling others and you not doing your own teaching yourself. Very good. He draws our attention to some acts of Israel. All oh, children of Israel, call to mind my favor which I bestowed on you and be faithful to your covenant with me. A covenant is an agreement. 
I shall fulfill my covenant with you and me and me alone should you fear. There's no God to fear beyond God. He is the chief of all gods. I am the Lord thy God, he says to Israel. And me and me alone should you fear. And do not set up another God besides me. Don't. Don't try seeking another God to try and make him my equal. Yeah. The devil is powerful, all right enough, but he's no equal to me. <laughs> this is why Allah makes a messenger, an apostle, to contend with an opponent of his. He's not enough for God himself to attack. So Allah makes an apostle to attack him and show his apostle how to win because he know both. He know the devil and he know his apostle. His apostle is from God himself, the beginning of man. From this, he makes the apostle aware of all the arts and all of the attacks of Satan, all of his arguments, then given the knowledge how to refute the enemy's arguments, given the knowledge how to make the enemy to bow to him. This is true, as I am here. The enemy do bow to me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this as the time is, is up. I'm put here in the answer to what you read in the Bible that Jesus said of himself that he would get done whatever he will and whatever Allah will they both was together in the will for a little you think of it I'm just like that whatever I will Allah will make it to come to pass Since Jesus recognized the fact that he was not that man, that prophet, that one that will come in the last day, he was not that. He had to die for his mistake. What was the mistake? The mistake was that he thought he was on time. But he learned that it was not on the time to usher in the judgment of this world. So then he prophesied and admitted that he was the head of time. He was not on time for it. So then he prophesied in his acknowledgement of his failure to come on the due time of the end of the world that he couldn't do it because it was before the time of the world. So then he prophesied, but, and words he says, when he comes, what he is that? He said of one that Moses prophesied of. 
And now I see through the Moses prophesied that that man is yet to come. He will give life to the dead. And he will destroy the enemy that I am ready and hope to destroy. That I am ahead of the time. So, in words he was saying, keep waiting. He will be alone. Whom the Father will send from himself. Well, I guess you say you're preaching too long. <laughs> But when you go to analyze what is written, it <clears throat> takes you longer to do that than the writer. <laughs> the writer could soon write it out, but he didn't know what he had wrote. <laughs> so I said, my beloved listeners, that it takes more time to untangle the entanglement than it did to tangle it up. <laughs> now, if this, and it is, the end of the world, you should know what the world is and what it has done contrary to the world that is coming in. So that you won't later say, I didn't see nothing wrong with the people. And that uh, if they said they were wrong, why didn't they prove this? Why didn't they prove that? Well, we are here to prove it. Let us take one in. You see, pardon me, I'm all always getting short somewhere. You see that the white man's world is now dying a natural death. Everything he lays hand to is a failure. If he were ruling in righteousness according to the teachings of the prophets of old, he would be prosperous instead of being unsuccessful, even in that which he has prospered. He has prospered and been successful in his wicked way. So now a righteous one comes which is an enemy to the enemies of evil. He sets up his kingdom on the very base of righteousness. He gets a servant to champion his world and makes him so firm that he is declared to be like a rock. A stone that is capable of breaking up stones. That if a stone falls on that stone, it will break to pieces. And if this stone falls on that stone, grind it to powder. He's a tough stone. So if you have a stone that you want to build on, get one that won't crack. If you put other stones on it. So the Bible says, symbolizing the man in a stone, he said, he's a stone. That is a tried stone. 
We don't make no mistake that it, that stone won't stand up and hold the weight. We have already tried it. And since we have tried the stone that we want to build on, we want this building to stand. So we build it on a stone that will stand. I'm not here to just to preach to you, John went to Nineveh, but I'm here to preach you why the trip was made for Jonah. I don't want you to think that I'm up here trying to show off. I'm up here doing my work that God sent me to do. You notice that here in the desert, as Moses gave to us some history of his travels with Israel and the desert, which also must be in temple, because it all reaches back at us. And if we don't know why he was out there in the desert doing what he did, that it is a history made to reach us here today. We must prove it. So what I'm telling you is what he prophesied. He said, the Lord thy God will rise up from among your brethren, a prophet like me. How is he like Moses? Jesus verified Moses' thing, that God will send us a prophet like Moses. Well, number one, Moses went after a people that had been deceived by people. He got the hold to Pharaoh, who was an enemy to Moses and his people. And so in this history, it gives us more light on the last messenger and his work. I'm not going to preach that sermon. I'm just catching up as I go along. <clears throat> what you really need, it is knowledge of understanding. <laughs> For misunderstanding is the hell to man. So I'm here to give to you the understanding of that of the vine, which you have failed to get from the enemy of the vine. Let you see what he looked like from the inside out. Then if you want to, after he have deceived you, to continue to live in his deceiving, that's up to you. No place in the history and in the scriptures that you will find where the last message will like to argue with you after he gives the truth to you. He leaves you to later ponder over it or you can go on disbelieving it until the truth bearing witness to the truth of the messenger coming from God in his actions against you. There is uh, many things in the scripture which some of you think that you still have the freedom to do as you please. You can't continue to do as you please in this world because Allah is erasing this world. So you won't have no place to carry on your evil. The other people, they are all righteous. 
and they won't allow you to live in their righteous world with your evil from the devil of this world whom they are destroying. You can't hold on to this. This is what I am telling you. You are not free to hold on to it. You are not free to act. I, I reckon I'll eat up the mic after a while. I keep on. <laughs> this is a free world granting you the freedom of doing like this world do. Now the next world coming in, you won't be free to do anything you want to. You will have to do just one thing, that that world, uh, rules, laws, and regulations bring to us. You'll take for an instance that this devil, having the freedom to do evil, and to teach us evil. He did not allow interference by prophets. He worked against them, so says the Bible. He beat and he enslaved them, imprisoned them, and then killed them because there was not one in his world. He was to rule the people by wickedness and not by righteousness. So I've been, as the book teach you, the last of the prophets. He won't put that small time stuff over on me. So, because Allah have caged me in his mercy and protection. Therefore, you can't get to me no more than you can get to God. And the way of going on. <laughs> now this I shall tell you. He have made me like himself. Whatever I do and whatever I want done or will, they use the word will, like he himself, it will come to pass, don't worry. This is just as much important as I'm teaching you the knowledge of him, the devil, that you should know the teacher. You're not going to see God coming down from heaven and stand here beside me to verify. Yeah, where the verification comes from him. If I see you continue to be contrary to what I am teaching you of yourself and the will of God. That will is in me too. You see? And that if you fail, Allah will let my will be done on you. My wife is at home, uh, gradually dying, but I didn't want her to die in a hospital, lest Satan would boast that her, the wife of the messenger, his God couldn't save her and he couldn't save her. So, okay, then we the winners, seeing uh, see a lie in there, I, I knew he would have something to say. That thing that he said would weaken your faith in me and God, whom you have never known. 
And you never did know the God that he preached to you. Because he never exists only himself. There's no such thing as a God living upstairs. As one preacher I know in the South, I used to go to his church just to hear him get on this part. That God, or that the earth is God's footstool. And the heaven is his throne. So I kept listening at that preacher, kept listening. I said, he got something like right there. And he did have something right. The earth is his footstool. This planet we are on is the first planet that was made with life on it from the sun. Regardless to the astronomy, saying Mercury is the first planet. Mercury was not the first planet that was made. Mercury is a sign. It's a sign of Allah's message. Oh, that if you had time. <laughs> the planet Mercury is so close to the sun that uh, the astronomers think that no life could exist. There it's too hot. Suppose now that we would be drawn through the atmosphere of the earth to the sun through cold that is so terrific that we couldn't live in that cold. The cold is always near and round, surrounded by a planet of life. You get where there is no such thing as a planet to mar the atmosphere with its water. You are getting into an altogether different universe to the one you come out of. Because you come out of a universe around your earth saturated with water. When you get into a dry space where there is no water to chill that space, you can't tell nobody what that space feel like to you since you're made of water. So you've got to put on something to shield yourself from being destroyed by dry space. Let me keep on. I'm not going to teach astronomy on that to you as God has taught me most everything I see most everything I see and most everything I hear he have taught me that did you not remember reading in the Bible in Psalms where David says that God had opened his ears and that uh, to make him to hear and his eyes to make him to see. These two factors of man, David picked up on it, and God taught him, even to the knowledge of birds and their language. He told me that he went in Africa, in the jungles, and learned uh, the language of the birds. So I thought over David. And I smiled, I said to myself, well, when are you going to teach me the language of birds? <laughs> Why did not he say the beast? Because that is a more finer characteristic about a bird than that is by a beast. Uh, this revelation of he refers to this devil as a beast due to his characteristics. It's similar to a wild beast. Well, I guess uh, you think you're getting away from your subject. No, I'm teaching my subject. <laughs> if you don't know the messenger who brought the message 
from God, how can you learn the sender? You've got to learn the messenger and his message, which he has brought to you, all but forcing you to listen, to learn the sender, God himself. You think that I'm stepping out the way when I say that I am sent from God. The people of earth have been hearing that ever since that they made an enemy to man for 6,000 years. And that uh, I'm only verifying what the others uh, said. I verified them. And they have verified me before I was born. And after they prophesied that Elijah will come and must come, he must come. Why? He must come to make a, a new path for his people. They're in the wrong path. That path they're in is a crooked path. The people don't live up right in that path because it's so crooked. Like the snake, serpent. The snake is so crooked that you've got to follow his trail around to find out where he went. You couldn't stand at the end of the line and look straight down the, the trail or the track that he made while he was crawling. You had to follow him. Because that curve there is subject to turn anyway. Right? <laughs> and that uh, uh, if you don't follow the, the curves that he's making, you won't overtake it. So Allah have made me to follow the curve and catch him. <laughs> See, theology of time. What time? The devil's time. Not our time. They didn't put up a clock for us. The time piece that was given to us, it don't never run down. <laughs> we all want to live, says the Bible in Quran. We have history of prophets and non-prophets living a long time. The Bible says by David that the wicked doesn't live out half that time. Well, that's right. But every man, the history that we read in the Bible and in other books and in the scriptures of the Holy Quran, all these long livers was prophets or something of the kind, some righteous person. Not a wicked person, but righteous, because the weakness uh, of the wicked destroys the wicked man. Because by nature, man was not made to destroy himself unless he be guided by a destroyer. We die quick under the guidance of the white man because that he comes here to live for just a few days and go. Oh yes, brothers, I'm going to let you go after a while. boss back here says it's ten minutes after four. And that, <laughs> and that I 
I've been going for an hour and a half. Well, it looked like to me we getting a new time fixer. I thought I was the boss of my time, yes. <laughs> but I'm getting to learn that I have a boss, too. I feel pretty good, brother, and I, I don't feel like I've been teaching for 30 minutes. I sat up and laid around my poor wife suffering with pains and whatnot, and I prayed over her. And so I don't care anything about too much sleep, no way. God didn't make me to sleep very long. He told me, he told others that was there listening at it. He said he will be like myself. He said about a couple of hours will be sufficient for him to sleep. <laughs> so I sit up and lay around on the side of the bed honoring her in her helpless state of sickness. So she, I noticed, would sleep sound as long as I was laying around on the bed or sitting there where she opened her eyes and see me. So I hated to leave out for the sake of one to sleep and rest. What kind of sleep and rest did God prepare for me? He didn't prepare no sleep and rest for me. No. If I'm to be like him, he don't have no rest. He worked night and day. And I have to work night and day. So when people get restless, you better let them go. Don't they are trying to be something else? That, that you will have another job to do. Of course, I'm not talking about brother back here. He just feel for me because he thinks I'm too, not too well. But he don't know. He's looking at the weakness of the body. And I'm looking at the strong faith of the body. That it can sustain the body. Strong belief in the security of you. Security of the power of God. You can't get too weak because weakness did not bring us into the world. Someday I'll come in the MGT and the FOI class and if they ask me to tell them what I meant by this word, I will teach to them. But I should give you a hint here. Man was created in haste. Therefore, he is hasty. That is true. So now you study on this till I get you in your classes. <laughs> then I'll teach you what that means. In fact about it, I'm not risen up from among my brethren. You are my brother. I'm not risen up among you into the knowledge of divine to not be able to answer 
to that physical fact because it is true. And you will bear me witness whenever I explain to you that that couldn't be nothing else but the answer. This is mentioned in the Holy Quran that Allah created you and then he make complete you. But the man that was made from us, he was created in haste. His time is short. He must hurry and get busy doing his work. But this is not quite the answer yet. And I can't answer it here, but I'll answer it in your classes or to your teacher. So the brother, I think, is getting hungry, and I am so full and nice. <laughs> he may have a, lots of work to do and I'm doing my work <laughs> today I had many subjects to just to sketch on with you and show you the truth of them. But since that the, so many other things has popped up in front of those subjects, I didn't intend it, but just give to you the knowledge of them in a few words. So since the time the brother thinks is closing up that I should keep standing up here, is up. Now I should go ahead home and uh, teach you again. I said to you, my beloved brothers and sisters, I'm not going to say beautiful brothers and sisters, you can't be beautiful until you accept Islam. <laughs> That is true. The mark of the devil will remain on you until removed by Allah in Islam. So, when you accept Islam, you start getting beautiful again. And we love to be beautiful because I see you all the time at the class. So come follow me, sisters. You will be beautiful. I have a little box sitting over here in the corner. Oh, yeah, you can pick your people out from there in the working. They're going to be so beautiful until you are admire that shadow a mile away. Oh, yes, they're getting on like that. That's why they don't leave. If they wasn't getting beautiful, they'd be going. But they're in the process now. And they believe that the end will be a beautiful woman. And that's right. Allah didn't come here to make us ugly. He didn't come here to let us remain ugly. Everyone that accepts him, he starts you to growing into a new like growth. And that growth is a beautiful person. I'm your teacher. See what I was going to say. Maybe you wouldn't be clapping. <laughs> yes, you was clapping right. So you watch me if I grow in ugliness. Grow in ugliness? You, who said you was pretty? <laughs> <laughs> But I only say this to tell you 
that the Holy Quran teaches us that you that turn to righteousness in this day and time at the end of the Caucasian War, Allah will make you grow into a new growth. And he told me about it when he was with me. So he said, no, brother. He said, we will have no ugly people. We will have no people with gray hair and bald head. He said, brother, all our hair and all our black hair, the color will come back to us. And the Holy Quran said, this is done by him blessing the righteous and growing into a new growth. Instead of you growing and aging up into decay, decay stops on the other side. No more decay. You, he told me, he said, we will look the same as we were when we were 16 years old. And that we keep that same look beautiful and tender as we find in David. He wanted to, wanted to God to turn him back into a tender age and turn him back into the energy that he had when he was in his teens. That he referred to it as a, a young goat so he could run, leap, and jump. Well, all of this he uh, proved that we will be just that. And the Holy Quran teaches us that the hereafter is something to be prayed for and desired. You don't say <coughs> just like that, but uh, you move on in days, months, and years, you're becoming a different person altogether. I used to, right here in Chicago, teach you six long hours. Sometime I would double it. I remember once out in Robin, Illinois, I doubled it. I started the teaching there in the town hall at 7 o'clock that evening and dismissed the people at 7 o'clock the next morning. When I am feeling very well, like I am now, I will yeah. teach you all night and all day. When I, when I was in Washington, making temple number four, that's temple number four there, I used to dismiss the group and go to some of the sisters' home to have dinner. When I get there, some of the group from the temple had already arrived. They know probably why I was going to have dinner. And they all were sitting there just eager, as it was when they arrived at the temple. Why, Sister Dorothy? Stand up, Sister Dorothy. Over here to my left. Oh, over here, in the box. Uh, this sister, she used to work in the secretary work there at that time. So I love apple pies. So when I would get to her house that evening, she probably have me a 
a nice, beautiful apple pie. So then I would try to go for it along with some lamb she had roasted. And here comes in the whole temple, almost there. I begin to have two thoughts about them. I wonder which one was I preaching to you, food, physical food or spiritual food. <laughs> this sister standing here is the brother, is the sister of the brother that is now my son-in-law. And she was a wonderful and a faithful sister. When I and others, her husband even, was in jail there in Washington, the district jail, for preaching Islam. As they were going into war and they didn't want no hindrance. And as they confessed to me, that's all we put you in jail for that you uh, will not be out in the public preaching to your people. Uh, that preaching that you're preaching, he says, which will prevent the successful prosecution of the war between us, Japan, and Germany. He said, not, not much a teaching, uh, that it is not what should be told, but we just want you put up to keep you from teaching it while we're trying to fight these two people, Germany and Japan. Not what you are teaching them. And I looked at him. I said, how can you put me up for the teaching if you don't put me up for what I'm teaching? When I came back to here to face the parole officer down in the loop of the USA, he admitted the same. He said, listen, Muhammad, you go ahead and teach what you always have been teaching. Teach the teaching just like you have. Nobody's going to bother you. And he confessed that we were just at war and we didn't want you to be out there telling your people that they had no rights into uh, this war uh, do they would have been just like you and nobody would have been able to uh, go through the war like it should have been going through as it should have been going through with well my brothers I guess I have to obey the boss he keep on standing back I hear frowning I don't know what he found for well, whether it's hunger. He may have a, a call by himself that it's time to come and feed the body before the spirit go out. <laughs> <laughs> you know why that I'm so long and my teachings to you, you never have heard it before. <laughs> and to try to untangle the snake that have gotten himself caught up, or rather we caught up with him. And he swallowed us so deep that it takes us a long time pressing his body to push us up to his mouth to get us out of it. But I have enjoyed you, and I wish that it was so that you could come here tomorrow and we just keep teaching. <laughs> You're going to be surprised at what you have not learned of the knowledge of self and others. You're going to be surprised. 
if Almighty God Allah makes me to be able enough as I am now, I will be back here Sunday, next Sunday. I'm charged with the delivery of the message. Not a one of you is charged with that. Because the message was given to me. And if I have 40 million helpers, they all, every one of them, is helping. Not that they are responsible for the message. If you read the Quran and Bible, I'm the only one God will hold responsible for you not getting the truth. Because he gave me the truth, and the way he gave it to me, he gave it to me like a flowing spring, or like a flowing uh, fountain. The fountain have enough drink in it to give everyone drink that come to drink. You don't need a new fountain. Just try and drink up what this fountain <laughs> So in the holy city Mecca, there is a well there. Call it the well of Zimzim. It also his name means one forever. And that uh, the righteous drinks uh, this literal water. But they shall drink the spiritual truth from Allah in which they will never be able to get to the end of it. There's so much. Now that this sign here is a sign of the truth that the messenger brings to you. Yes, he is the well himself. Yes, <clears throat> it made me to think over Jesus talking to the wicked woman who had been so wicked all her life. She was a woman that was filled with adultery and that she married one husband after another. Of course, she would not be anything today if she was here. She'd laugh at her seven husband being a small beginning. But I'm not going to go into the interpretation of that. <laughs> but I will some day when I have more time. But that well there, I drink out of it myself. It's water that <clears throat> is very light and easy to digest in your body and my body. I tried it. Little boys come around serving you with it. They expect you to give them a little something. And so I kept reaching for another cup. I wanted to know whether or not that this water was really health water and would not have any effect on your body. So I kept drinking cup full after cup full. When I left from there, my stomach felt just as light as it did when I came there. I said, that must be the, the well that you drink out of and you don't need to be thirsty because you can drink a plenty of water, that water that don't lay heavy on your stomach. Of course, the spiritual side of the teaching of the well never go dry in the Bible and hold up one board. That it is uh, referring to the spiritual well of God. So I'm going to get out of here and go home just because I feel good that I don't stand up here and wear out that good feelings of yours. You know, we go so far at a thing, 
then we begin to settle down in it. Then we don't need to be called to come to it, then we are already in it. So you have been listening to me for quite a while, and so I'm going to now to turn you back over in the hand of our assistant minister to let him see whether or not that you brought him anything other than just preaching. That the man can't preach if he get hungry. <laughs> but I'm so happy that Allah made me feel well today to talk to you. So I'm going to say to you that visit us today. I love you so well if I had a table for each one of you, I would tell the brothers to put the food on it. I can, by the help of Allah, feed every one of you that is here and won't be in the break line tomorrow, begging for me some bread. <laughs> I did ten, feed 10,000 once. And I still can feed 10,000. Not that I'm boasting that I have a lots of money to do so, nor am I boasting that I will call some miraculous thing like the Bible say happen to Jesus to feed 7,000 people. It would be fed similar to that, but I don't call it a miraculous thing. I could give 20,000 of you, this is not ex exaggerating, this afternoon, Eat all you want. But after you eat all you want, Allah makes it to appear to me I am not giving away nothing. I don't miss it. I don't go home sitting down and say, if I had not give all them people that food, I'd have had some. So this is true. I never miss nothing I give you. Yes, nothing. So I thank you. Don't you will be telling me, well, we thank you that we can give you. <laughs> but I'm just happy to look at you and I just want to talk with you. First, I want to say to all of you teachers of any other organization other than Islam, and if it's Islam, I thank Allah for you being present this afternoon to hear what Elijah Muhammad have to say. And if you want to question me, plenty, all you want to write me at 4847 Woodlawn. 48, 47, Woodlawn. 48, 47, Woodlawn. <laughs> so I thank you. I'm going to turn you back in the hands of our Assistant Minister, Minister Shah. That name is from uh, one of the set, which were three of the scientists from, from Muhammad teachings. This 
sha or shata, as you may find it in some phrase of that language, uh, wrote, they were scientists on Islam and helped building up the Holy Quran that Muhammad said he saw and was given. Well, not say he saw, but the words that was given to him from Allah. They put them in a book called Holy Quran. Holy Quran, and one of the most finest meanings to us is a book of healing. It means healing. And it is healing us of the womb of Satan. So I'm going to turn you back in to the hand of him, and he will dismiss you soon. And uh, you help him. I tell you the way to help him to do this job real quick. Uh, don't wait till he asks you for a donation. Just hey, 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 here you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning you back in the hands of my system to dismiss you now. I'm not asking you to stand and get up, go out as soon as you see my back to him. You stay here and see what he have to say. <laughs> so in the name of Allah, may the peace and the blessings of Allah go with you wherever you may go and bless you in understanding the knowledge of his word as I have given it to you. I salam alaikum.